application. So our stepping stone to that is development into the open, in the open, which is a slightly different but aligned process. So um, we're doing that through GitHub. Um, so this is the, the live Git, essentially. Um, so don't be alarmed at the fact that there are lots of things in here that need doing. That means we're testing it properly. If you look at any open source product, you'll find that it is full of things. Um, we're using a milestone type approach. So if you look next to these, you'll see 1.1, 1.2, and so on. So when it goes into open testing, if you find issues or you find new things that you'd like it to do, what we'd like you to do is to come into GitHub, create a new issue, and chuck it into the pot. And that way that we can get collective feedback on um, functionality ideas and bugs. And um, we pick those up and deal with them. So when we put the um, information about how to log in, I'll put more details on how to do that. So that was cool. I meant to spend 10 minutes on that. 10 minutes just showing you um, student <coughs> success plan. So don't keep you from your lunch. So we're doing all right. Okay, right, now I am going to drop down to dates for now, so you have to, have to bear with me, but um, I think it's useful just to give you a quick, um, quick walk through the um, process. So if we look down there, at the, um, in the middle, we've got the learning analytics processor, and we've got a two-way arrow from that to the learning records warehouse. So this is our pure implementation of the architecture. And um, well that then um, connects to the alert and intervention system. So the bit I'm going to show you, um, I'm not going to show you the learning analytics processor running, because there's nothing to look at, basically. Um, what I'm going to do is show you the output. So learning analytics processor runs, sends stuff to the learning records warehouse, and then we're going to hop up to the alert and intervention tool and see how that all hangs together. Michael, uh, I had a couple of questions yep. from people earlier that just weren't really familiar with yep. this whole architecture yep. and were wondering how it interacted with the products of uh, the vendors out there, for example. Yep. So let, let me... It, probably so, worth a quick yep. overview of that. If, so, yeah. okay, so the way that that essentially works is that, so I'm going back to GitHub really, I'm afraid on this, is that um, all of the interfaces... Um, same as the student app are all of the interfaces are worked on exactly the same way. So all in GitHub, um, open documentation. I'm actually going to show you the predictive model output right now actually. So this is the um, recipe that we're using for the alert to be sent. Um, I'm going to show you it, I'm going to show you it in a moment, the same process in terms of logging issues and so on. So that, this was the bit that I talked about on the slide saying that a contributor would come along and get involved in the GitHub you know, process. Is that kind of I, well, question? I don't, I don't know actually if it does. Um, I think the, the issue is if an institution wants to use the JISC architecture yeah. or is thinking about it, yeah. how does that relate to whether they pick up individual tools from other vendors? Would they be able to just use some of the architecture? Yeah, so this uh, goes back to the beginning. That the um, I mean, this is stuff that we're yeah, so yeah, used to now. Yeah, we've yeah. we've so, forgotten so that some people the this was don't know the basics. Explaining that the blue is the core. Yeah, and the um, excluding the blue things at the bottom. Or, no, they're or, all or the, core. They're core. So yeah. They're, but, so there's yeah. no point in anyone writing their own blackboard to plug in, yeah, yeah. Um, basically. Um, whereas the orange bits are sort of swap out and put other bits in. So it was essentially the flow that I talked about that either a unit in the first session, so either a institution and a supplier would come together essentially and say, right, we want to take part. So to use the JISC architecture, yeah. you, you would normally have those blue bits at the bottom in place in yeah. your own institution. You would then um, send your data to the yeah. cloud hosted learning yeah. records warehouse yeah. Yeah. Um, and you would then be able to plug in those other. Correct. Yeah. tools which could either be the JISC ones or yeah. from other yeah. organisations. Is it, is it reliant on having a particular vendor or selection of vendors as your, the, as your student system, information system, for example? Yeah. Um, basically, um, as it 
Just in the Those here will have more and more kind of out of the box, ninety <coughs> percent out of the box solutions for that. <coughs> so once we've integrated six once, for example, it's repeatable. Um, if you've got your own student record system, um, that's not the scratch on stuff. Get used to that. Yeah. Wait, wait, sure. No, go ahead. Um, we, we had a question about um, maintaining that. So, if uh, government regulations change, the data may change, yeah. systems change, yeah. just keep those working. Yeah. Yes. So, um, basically, um, the, the way this works is on the concept of um, essentially minor, um, major and minor releases with an annual major release which may essentially be a fairly dramatic change to realign with any governmental changes, system changes and all that sort of thing. So this was going back to the first slide, it was the role of the steering group that we want people to <coughs> push that direction forward. So yeah, absolutely, it's on down the process. Right, I'm going to give my last five minutes showing what I was going to show you. So, Learning analytic process at the run, it was spotted that a bunch of students are at risk. It sends a message to the learning records warehouse. Okay, so um, without having to get too much into the code, it's gone in. That means once it's in there, we can use that for, for other analytics purposes. This one is generated by the US model at the moment. If you scroll down, you'll see there in the bit that says extensions some extra data about the alert that has caused it to medium risk. Um, and these are the things it's made up of. That's in there. What happens then is that that can then be received by a student success plan. So, in our model, um, and the screen is smaller than the other one here, I'm going to adjust this. So, in our model, each student has has a tutor ID. So this is doesn't have to be a tutor, but they have to call it something. But it's somebody who is responsible for receiving the alerts from that student. Um, so it might be a tutor, it might be a central office that are responsible for supporting the student. We're really finding it with varies. Um, but the important thing is that somebody has to be notified. Otherwise, it's kind of pointless. Um, so I've logged in as Beth, I guess that's still my little her name, she's Beth first, Beth last. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and these are the alerts that are generated by the students that um, I'm responsible for. So the, the basic concept is I can go in and see them. And what we've done is pulled out a small number of, of um, risk indicators. Now these are just a start of pretend to to get a bit of conversation of going and a bit of um, about the concept of, of how it all works. But these are things that can be generated um, from the data model and just give you a really quick view on what the student's like and what might be the cause. Because you might have a load of these and you just want to get a very quick overview, then you delve into the detail. So the ones that we pulled in as our starter for 10 um, are um, enrollment count, um, which um, so gray means that there's no ideal value um, and the other ones are traffic by one so enrollment count is just it's there in the data you as a tutor might have a good, the right, uh, an idea of what kind of um, number of modules a student should be enrolled in this is just a quick view um, last activity time is days since they last did anything this is what i tested yesterday and it really did go green when, he did, when i made him do stuff so that was cool <laughs> Um, last graded work, um, so it was when they last handed stuff in. Again, as a tutor, you'd know, you know what sort of value to expect there. So there's no traffic light, it's just a quick bit. And then previous withdrawals and retakes are just you know, fairly straightforward indicators of the type of student they are. So those are just um, kind of essentially examples of things that can be done on the data. And then they get updated <coughs> as the data updates. So you've gone in, you have um, seen that Ian as, uh, as at risk, um, but he's still doing stuff that's cool, but he's had a lot of retakes. So at that point there, you can um, do an action. So you can go into the journal and essentially record what you're going to do, perhaps pass a message to somebody, 
and, and start dealing with the student. So, um, given time, we we'll won't go into that in any more detail, but you can see the general process. So, um, I'll stop there because it's one minute from I'm supposed to stop, and I lent Richard my power supply. <laughs> and I can see my battery sniffing. What Sorry. <laughs> Vibration there already. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yeah, um, any more questions? I had a question just about those at risk indicators. Yeah. Are those are just going to be prescribing what those are, or are those going to be unique to each institution? So, to start with, we'll do some out of the box ones and then um, work with the institutions to see what would be more useful. Mm -hmm. It might well be, when we go further along, down the line, this might be how our kind of premium premium model works. So, out of the box, you get some that are there, mm -hmm. and then you, you, you pay the extra to get it one filled. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, uh, SSP is highly configurable, so it yeah. is it is able to be so. It just depends on what you just want to. Yeah, to yeah. So it's, it's one of the things that we want to try basically with the first people that are trying it, and we thought it was easier to put some things there to show what could be done as a starter. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Well, once your student app goes out to yeah. the institution, what are your plans for evaluating? Um. So. For, right, so with the, for the first set, it's very controlled group of students, so it's smallish numbers, so it'll be fairly traditional feedback from the students via you know, workshop type things. When it goes wider, um, the um, there are two extra bits then that we want to add in. One is we, we're going to um, build in a straightforward feedback mechanism in the app, essentially, because it's not very helpful when it goes into the store. And the other is... Um, more um, analytic stuff about the app being used. So there, there are lots of techniques essentially for um, building analytic data to see, okay, student only went that far and never did it again sort of thing. So that's more of the use level. And also inviting students into the GitHub as well. Those are our current plans. Any, any extras, that. Neil, that haven't covered? No, but just to say we're about to kick off with uh, Abate in the next two three weeks, and uh, Moriamo's here. So if you want to discuss that, I don't, I don't, don't see her now, but uh, yeah, yeah. Right there. Oh, right there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so you might want to chat to Moriamo about that as well. But uh, yeah, I'll be working with them on that, and we're looking forward to seeing students' reactions. Then we've got Strathclyde in the pipeline as well, and um, so English is up there. Okay, so this has seemed a slightly more like a healing meeting with Michael dispensing with his crutches and leaping about learning analytics. I can hop, that's why. But it just gets like really tiring. <laughs> so anyway, that.